know, last night my friend told me an awesome joke about Parkinson's. I don't want to tell it now because I'm kind of shaky on the details. <laughs> and have you ever thought that the one instruction that doesn't have to be given on a bottle of medication for Parkinson's, and that is shake well before use. <laughs> Hi hey everybody, it's Dr. Ryan. Hope you and your family are well. Today we're going to be covering an approach to examination of the exopyramidal system with specific emphasis on Parkinson's disease. God bless you. So this is an outline of our talk. We're going to be covering a clinical case. Then we're going to get into the approach to examination of the exopyramidal system. And we're going to use a question and answer format to address the different um, you know, aspects of Parkinson's disease in terms of the etiology, the clinical features. We're going to touch a bit on Parkinson plus syndromes, look at investigative modalities and treatment modalities. Are you ready? And then, of course, we're going to talk about encouragement from the Bible for a bit. So here's our clinical case. Let's just move this for a bit so we can see. Thank you so much. 64-year-old man presents with symptoms of tremor. Uh, let's just get my pen in there. Tremor and a generalized feeling of slowing down. Slow down. His tremor bothers him on the left side. His past medical history is noticeable for depression, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Now he is taking fluoxetine of 40 mg daily, Nanopro 10 mg BD, and a tovastatin 20 mg Nocte. On physical exam, he has a resting tremor with the presence of cogwheel rigidity. Hmm. When observing his gait, you note that he has slow, Shuffling steps with difficulty maneuvering to turn around. His facial features show diminished range of emotion and appear somewhat flat. Eye movements are full. Mental status is normal. You suspect Parkinson's disease. What's your first choice of therapy? Is it going to be A, you're going to defer therapy until further diagnostic studies are performed? Is it B, uh, levodopa, carbidopa? Is it C, roticotine? D, selegaline? Or is it either... Uh, B or C can be used, or any of the above can be used. Mm, I wonder. Okay, let's talk about Parkinson's disease, everybody. So this is a beautiful diagram taken from um, Stanford Medicine 25, illustrating the cardinal features on inspection of someone who you suspect has Parkinson's disease. So you know that they have a, a stooped posture, they have a mask-like face, which we often term hypomemia. There's a rigidity of the back with a typical flexed, um, posture of the elbows and wrists, they had forward tilt of the trunk with diminished arm swing, hand tremor, it's a rest tremor, we'll talk about the characteristics of the tremor a bit later, tremor in the hands and the legs, slightly flexed hips and knees, together with the flexed elbows and wrists, and they have shuffling short uh, stepped gait with fascination and freezing, and we'll talk about those features, but these are by and large on inspection, what you're going to look for in somebody in whom you suspect has Parkinson's disease. So let's talk about examination of the exopyramidal system for a bit, right? In the face, we look at the following. Titubation of the head, right? Which is basically shaking of the head. It can be up and down or left to right. right? A mask-like expressionless face. That is a stellar for Parkinson's disease. And this is something we affectionately term hypomemia. There'll be less blinking with staring looks. <laughs> Called a serpentine stare, right? Uh, <laughs> tremor of the eyelids may be present, something we call blepharoclonus. There could be dribbling of saliva as well, okay? Then you want to talk to the patient and you notice their speech. So the speech has some characteristics. It has a slow initiation. It's husky. Sometimes can be slurred, indistinct, lacking intonation, low volume and monotonous. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you have this thing called palilalia. Now, palilalia refers to repetition of the end of the word, right? All right, the glabella tap called myosin sign is positive. We're going to see a, a picture of how this looks. So what you basically do is tap the forehead ab above the bridge of the nose repetitively out of the patient's field of vision. And a normal person, blinking will stop after about three to five blinks, back in Parkinsonism, the patient continues to blink. But the sign is notoriously unreliable. Then you want to look at the actual tremor and you know that it is a rest tremor, it's present at rest and it often disappears or reduces with activity or while the patient is holding something, okay? 
The patient also demonstrates significant rigidity, and we, we, we classify this in terms of two types or two flavors, right? There's lead pipe and then there's cogwheel rigidity. So lead pipe rigidity is better seen at the elbow, cogwheeling better assessed at the wrist. Alrighty, so this is a, a picture demonstrating the glabella tap or myosin sign. So you can see the examiner is tapping the forehead repetitively above the bridge of the nose out of the patient's field of vision. And we said that normally it's three to five blinks, but the patient who has Parkinson's will often blink for longer than this. But this sign is not very reliable, everybody. Then you want to test for hypokinesia. So you ask the patient to, to, to perform these small precise motor movements like asking them to fasten, uh, fasten a button. And you notice the patient is unable to do this or can only do so slowly. You want to ask the patient to write and you note micrographia, which is very small letters, and writing you note is tremulous and untidy. Then you want to ask the patient to touch the tip of all the fingers with their thumb successively and ask to count as in one, two, three, four, etc. And what you notice is that there is very slow initiation. The patient's unable to do so or can do so only very, very slowly. Or there's a progressive reduction in the amplitude of each movement during counting. Right? Progressive. So we start off normal and become slower. Right? One, two, three, four, eight. You get the idea. Then ask the patient to do rapid fine finger movement like piano playing. And you note that this becomes indistinct and tremulous as well. You're going to ask the patient to open and close their hands repetitively or ask them to tap uh, with the foot or the hand. And it gradually becomes slow and slower and slower and smaller in amplitude. You also want to ask the patient to perform two simultaneous motor acts and they are unable to do so. So this is detecting bradykinesia, asking the patient to simulate piano playing. And this is twiddling right, of the fingers, you know, the very slow and reduction in amplitude of those movements. You also want to ask the patient now to stand and note the posture. So the patient often has a flexed and a stooped attitude as we've seen in our first diagram. And with gait, you want to ask the patient to walk and then to turn quickly. And you notice that there's going to be a difficulty in starting to walk. This is something we call freezing. There's also paucity of movement, diminished arm swing, a flexed attitude, and an inability to turn rapidly, something we call the fractionated turn. Those are the cardinal features, and it's also fascination as well. So everybody, what really is Parkinsonism? It is a syndrome consisting of four main elements, and I like to encompass these in a mnemonic. You know, I'm a mnemonic kind of guy, and so we call this trap. I'm not setting a trap for you, but this is a trap. T for tremor, which is a resting tremor, which diminishes with activity. R is rigidity. Typically, cogwheeling, lead pipe rigidity, A speaks to akinesia or bradykinesia with slowness in initiating movement. And uh, P is loss of postural reflexes. So if you get TRAP, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, postural reflexes are lost. That's Parkinsonism. All right. And so often a test we do in geriatrics is called the uh, timed up and go test. Right. So you ask the patient uh, to rise from a standard chair and to walk to a line on the floor approximately 10 feet away. Then once you do that, to turn and to return to the chair and sit down. And you time them in terms of how long it takes them to perform this, uh, this routine or this examination. The normal time to finish the test is between 7 and 10 seconds. And we note that patients who cannot complete the task in that time probably have some mobility problems, especially if they take longer than 20 seconds. The, the differential for, uh, you know, a longer than normal time is broad, but Parkinson's is one of those differentials, right? Mention causes of Parkinsonism as per age. So among the early folks, the common causes of Parkinsonism are the idiopathic variety of flavor, which is what we call Parkinson's disease, idiopathic Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, or paralytic agitans is another way of saying Parkinson's disease. However, Parkinsonism can also be a secondary phenomenon in the setting of certain drugs. It could be post-encephalitic Parkinsonism induced by neurosyphilis, previous head trauma, what we call the so-called punch drunk syndrome, and a cerebral tumor as well. If we see Parkinsonism in a young person, the causes include post-encephalitic Parkinsonism, drugs, don't forget Wilson's disease, all right, and head trauma. So what is Parkinson's disease really? It's a good question to ask, nice to ask. Parkinson's disease is primary or idiopathic Parkinsonism. It is a neurodegenerative disorder involving the basal nuclei characterized by, like we said, uh, 
tremor, rigidity, akinesia, or pericinesia, and loss of your postural reflexes. Okay, so now what relevant history is important to take from the patient? So first up, you got to elicit a history of head trauma, for instance, punch drunk syndrome, any drugs which have been implicated in causing Parkinsonism, and these include phenothiazines, butyrifenones, metoclopramide, otherwise termed maxillon, alpha methyl dopa, lithium, valproic acid, tetrabenazine. Okay, and a history of fever, convulsion, headache, and coma, which implies post-encephalitic syndrome. Is there a history of jaundice or stigmata of chronic liver disease? We're thinking, okay, this could be hepatolenticular degeneration, typical of Wilson's disease. Is there a history of headache, vomiting, convulsion, which may point to a cerebral tumor? Okay, describe the, 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 the dyskinesia or hypokinesia that we see in Parkinsonism. So dyskinesia is a long word, right? but essentially it is the difficulty in initiating motor activity or speaks to poverty or slowness of movement. All right? In Parkinsonism, there is delay or slowness in initiating movement. Also, we find this progressive slowing. Um, is also a diminished speed and amplitude of these repetitive movements, such as opening and closing the hand or finger tapping. There's difficulty in executing two motor acts simultaneously. What are the main differences, everybody, between essential and a Parkinson Parkinsonian tremor? All right, so let's just get this out of the way. Yeah, alrighty, and let's just get my pointer in there. So, um, in terms of the stimulus, in essential tremor, the tremor is present only with voluntary movement, it's so-called action tremor. But in Parkinsonian, it's called a rest tremor because it's present at rest and diminishes with uh, intended activity. Right? Family history is probably more common in essential tremor than in the Parkinsonian tremor. The body parts involved in essential tremor are often the hands and the head, but Parkinsonian tremor involves the hands, the legs, and really the head. Distribution and onset in essential tremor is bilateral and symmetrical, and this is a big tip-off, right? But in Parkinsonian tremor, that usually starts unilaterally and asymmetrically, right? Uh, the essential tremor is indeed sensitive to alcohol, but Parkinsonian is not. And the course of the essential tremor is stable and slowly progressive, but in Parkinsonian, it's progressive, alrighty? Describe the typical gait that we see in Parkinsonism. So we've touched on this already, but just to mention, it's... Um, Characterized by rapid, small, shuffling steps, which is what we call festination, with stu stooping forward on a narrow base in order to avoid falling. The patient often hardly raises the foot from the ground, and the feet may actually scrape the ground. There is less swinging of the arms during walking, and the patient has difficulty stopping him or herself. There's also difficulty with rapid turning. We spoke about this. We call it the fractionated gait, and the patient tends to turn in block. And the obstacles cause the patient to freeze in place. What are the other abnormal gates we see in the setting of Parkinsonism? All right, um, let's just get this up there. Propulsion. The propulsion occurs when the patient, if pushed from behind, is unable to stop him or herself and falls forward. Retropulsion is the opposite of this. If you push the patient from the front, he is unable to stop himself and may fall backward, oh dear. Then Kinesia Paradoxica occurs when the patient's unable to initiate a movement, but once the movement is started, the patient can complete the whole act and see it through to completion. For instance, the patient may run down the stairs, but cannot stop at the bottom. Right? Or the patient is unable to initiate a movement, but during emotion or fear can perform the movement. Example, running out of the house in the event of a fire. Synkinesia occurs, and it's a term which implies voluntary movement of one part that is associated with involuntary movement of the opposite side of the body. If for example, in the upper limb, where there's voluntary closing and opening of the right hand, causes involuntary closing and opening of the left hand as well. Right, describe the reflexes and plantar responses in Parkinsonism. So importantly, all reflexes and plantar responses are normal in Parkinsonism. However, you may have difficulty eliciting this on clinical exam because of the rigidity. The plantar is flexor. It may be extensor if associated with the following disorders. There's post-encephalitic Parkinsonism and other diseases, which is what we term the atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. That being shy Drager syndrome, known as multi-system atrophy. Then we get progressive supranuclear palsy, also termed steel richardson Oswiski Oswiski syndrome. <laughs> then there's olivopontine cerebellar atrophy and corticobasal degeneration. Okay, an important question to ask, what are the Parkinson plus syndromes? Oh dear. These are characterized by features of Parkinsonism which are associated with other degenerative diseases 
of our good friends, the cerebellum and the pyramidal tract. Features are, number one, poor responsibility for dopa. Number two, symmetrical features. Remember we said that idiopathic Parkinson's is unilateral. But if you have symmetrical features, especially at the early age, you're thinking about a Parkinson plus syndrome. Thirdly, there's the early onset of postural instability, falls, dementia, hallucinations, autonomic dysfunction, and so forth. Fourthly, the presence of pyramidal tract signs, which is not attributed to a previous cerebrovascular accident. There's also the presence of cerebellar signs or ocular signs like nystagmus and gaze palsy. Tranquil symptoms are more prominent than our appendicular symptoms. And you have the absence of structural etiology, such as normal pressure hydrocephalus, all right? What is indeed the pathophysiology in Parkinsonism? What really is wrong? So as we know that in idiopathic Parkinsonism, there is progressive degeneration of the pigmented dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra. Uh, and they also have the formation of these eosinophilic inclusion bodies in the neurons, something we call Lewy bodies, which contain our beloved alpha synuclein and ubiquitin, ubiquitin, right? The Lewy bodies are the pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease, and hence there is a deficiency of dopamine and melanin with a relative increase in cholinergic transmission. So there's basically an imbalance between dopamine and acetylcholine. So this is a beautiful uh, diagram taken from Netta's Internal Me Medicine. Thank you so much, guys. So here, as we can see, everybody, let's just get my pointer in there. We have our beloved basal nuclei with the corpus striatum, with the caudate nucleus that puts him in the globus pallidus. And we note here how dopamine is taken up by these surviving nigral neurons converted to, sorry, dopa is taken up and converted to dopamine and released from varicosities and synaptic junctions in the corpus striatum. And the main problem here is that there's going to be a deficiency of these dopaminergic neurons in a substantia nigra. So you have a lack of dopamine and an increase in cholinergic transmission and you have Lewy bodies which eventually are going to form. Alrighty. What is the mental state in Parkinsonism? So initially, intellect and memory are normal. There may be slowness of thought and memory retrieval, something we call bradyphrenia, and subtle, very subtle personality changes. It's important to note that depression occurs in one-third of patients with Parkinsonism, global dementia in 20%, as well as some degree of psychosis. And the important to note, everyone, that drug treatment may precipitate confusion. What are the stages, the clinical stages of Parkinsonism? Well, stage one is unilateral involvement, implying hemiplegic Parkinsonism. Stage two is bilateral involvement, but there's no postural affectation. Stage three is bilateral involvement with mild postural abnormality. Stage four is stage three plus postural instability requiring substantial degree of help. Stage five is severe disease and the patient is restricted to a bed or a wheelchair. So this is how it looks, the different stages. So we said that Stage one is unilateral involvement with the blank facies. The affected arm in a semi-flex position, typical with the tremor, and the patient tends to lean to the affected side. Stage two is where we have bilateral involvement with early postural changes, slow shuffling gait with diminished excursion of the legs. Stage three is where we have pronounced gait disturbances and moderate generalized disability, postural instability with a tendency to fall over. Stage four is where we have significant disability, and as you can see, requiring assistance. Stage five is complete invalidism, and the patient is confined to a bed or chair, cannot stand or walk even or with assistance. And the top three diagrams show the typical clinical manifestations, right? The rest tremor, which diminishes on um, purposeful function and difficulty in performing simple manual functions may be the initial symptom. How are you going to investigate someone who has Parkinsonism? So first up, you want an image, right? CT scan or MRI brain may be done if there is a pyramidal, cerebellar, or autonomic involvement, or if you're not really not sure of what's going on. If the patient is young, now young, they say age is relative, right? <laughs> You're only as young as you feel. And I feel like I'm a recycled teenager, I'm 37 years old. Right? But anyway, if the patient is below 50 years old, you want to screen for Wilson's disease. So to do this, you do your serum seroloplasmin, which typically is low in the setting of Wilson's. Your serum copper is typically going to be high. 24-hour urinary copper is going to be high. But importantly, if you are going to give the copper chelator, right? Then, and you repeat your 24 hour unit copper, it becomes low. So, that's the kind of conformity test that you can do, right? Um, you can do your liver function tests and liver biopsy with quantitative measurements of copper, all right? And the third thing you can do is functional dope immunergic imaging in the way of a SPIC scan or a PET scan. Outline treatment modalities in Parkinson's. Well, there's five big uh, arms. So firstly, treatment of the cause and withdrawal of any offending drugs if they are on board. Then secondly, symptomatic treatment of the tremor, the rigidity, and the bradykinesia. 
Thirdly, get your allied health disciplines in your physiotherapy, your speech therapy, surgical treatment as well, as well as occupational therapy and rehabilitation. How do we treat Parkinson's disease? So in general, you know, the general rules, number one, is that drugs are usually not given in mild cases because of the significant potential for side effects. And drugs should only be commenced if the patient has significant disability and has daily symptoms which are functionally debilitating. So first up, our go-to guy is a combination of levodopa and a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. So levodopa, carbidopa is a treatment of choice. That's the, 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 the most famous combination, but you can also do levodopa with benzeterazide. The drug should be started at the lowest possible dose and gradually titrated upwards as needed. The tremor may be controlled by our anticholinergic drugs, for example, orphanogen, which is less used because of side effects. The side effects of anticholinergics, as we know, dry mouth, blood vision, constipation, urinary retention, and the likes. Other drugs that we can consider to be used are amantadine, your monoamine oxidase B inhibitors like selegaline, your cathical uh, O-methyl transferase inhibitors, intacapone. That sounds like Al Capone, <laughs> but it's intacapone. Right, dopamine agonists like pergolide. So um, then fourthly, we said general measures. So uh, get your allied health disciplines in your physiotherapy, your speech therapy, your OT, rehab the patient. Other measures is cognitive impairment and psychiatric symptoms may be helped by river stickling. Trazodone is helpful in treating depression and insomnia. For psychosis, confusion, or hallucination, your atypical antipsychotics can be used. That's either zyprasidone or lanzapine, risperidone, uh, aripiprazole, quetiapine, any of those. Please note that levodopa is absolutely contraindicated in the presence of melanoma. And a nice mnemonic for learning these different uh, therapeutic medical options is when you eat a delicious carrot salad. Mm, it looks lovely. Like you want to put that together with a biryani and dal. <laughs> Tantalizingly taste. I so, carrot salad, so C stands for COMPT inhibitors like selegaline, uh, sorry, like intacapone. S is selegaline. A is amantadine. L for levodopa with carbidopa combination. A is for anticholinergics. And D for dopamine agonists. And together that makes carrot salad. Those are your different therapeutic options. Just mention some surgical options in the treatment of Parkinsonism. So, there's a couple of them uh, a stereotactic thalamotomy. Pallidotomy, subthalamotomy, and deep brain stimulation. Uh, what is this thing called end of dose deterioration? So we note that after three to five years, of, so protracted use of levodopa, there may be fluctuating response to levodopa in up to half of patients. And these include what we call end of dose dyskinesia, which is also termed the wearing off effect. And this is simply due to progression of disease and loss of capacity to store dopamine. Uh, and as a result, the duration of action of levodopa becomes progressively shorter. How do we circumvent this? Um, so sorry, as a result, the patients complain of freezing and rigidity before the next dose of levodopa. We circumvent this by simply dividing the levodopa into smaller or more frequent doses, also by the use of our slow-release preps or adding a dopamine agonist or amantadine. Now, what is the on-off phenomenon? So we note as well that after prolonged use, the drug may become less effective. And there are sudden unpredictable change in response in which we have periods of severe Parkinsonism, uh, in the way of freezing and immobility, termed the off period, alternating with periods of dopamine-induced dyskinesia, agitation, chorea, and dystonic movements, the so-called on period. This can be managed by simply lowering the dose of levodopa or by adding selegaline with levodopa, as well as a compton inhibitor, dopamine agonists may also be used. So everybody, coming back to our clinical case, we had an elderly gentleman with symptoms of tremor, generalized feeling of slowing down that affects, and the tremor affects his left side. He's known with depression, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's on those meds. On physical exam, he has a resting tremor with cognitive rigidity. When observing his gait, he has typical Parkinsonian gait. He has hypomemia. He's got a normal mental state. You suspect Parkinson's disease. What is your choice of therapy? Drum roll, please. Drrr, ding. Either B or C can be used. So either levodopa, carbidopa, or reticotine. This patient exhibits the classical features of Parkinson's disease, and treatment is either with levodopa, carbidopa, or dopamine agonist as your initial treatment choice. All right. So everybody, I just want to encourage you from scripture regarding obedience. The book of Psalm chapter 119 verse 165. So Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And this particular verse tells us, those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious. 
for nothing, but in all things through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Verse 7 says, And then the peace of God which transcends all human understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. Peace that only the Lord Jesus can give you. In the midst of chaos, you can have peace in your heart. How do you do this? By loving the instructions of the Lord and by committing all your petitions to Him in thanksgiving. All right, so I pray peace upon you and peace upon your family. These are my references for today's video. Um, a big thank you to all of these. And I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll see you soon with another helpful video on my channel, Algorithms in Internal Medicine and Mnemonics. <laughs> God bless.